Good morning, everybody. It is my distinct pleasure to be introducing today's Grand Round speakers, Dr. Peter Bitterman, um, who probably really needs no introduction, but I will uh, try to do him some justice. Um, Pete received his MD at Yale and then did his residency and fellowship at University of Chicago and NIH, respectively. And the University of Minnesota has been fortunate that he spent his faculty career here and is a professor in the Department of Medicine and Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine here. Um, I think Pete really represents a role model for physician scientists. He sees patients as well as runs a uh, very successful basic and translational research lab. His interests, clinical and research, lie in lung disease and particularly those associated with tissue fibrosis. He's done some really beautiful work unraveling mechanisms of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is uh, really a devastating disease for patients and involves um, a number of cell types and factors that a lot of us in this room know and love, like fibroblasts, macrophages, extracellular matrix, uh, more recently microRNAs. So we were uh, very happy that he accepted our invitation to come and tell us about the work going on now. Thank you. Thank you. So the on switch is on. Hopefully Buster will settle here. So, um, yeah, I came to Minnesota in uh, 1985, and uh, Cindy and I were looking for a place that had two good jobs. Uh, and I, uh, before I began looking, of course, I spoke to the person who I probably respected most at NIH, which is, there were many that I respected a lot. Uh, but as you know, George Martin, I said, George said, well, Pete, if you're going to keep working in fibrosis, there's a few places you ought to look at seriously. Uh, and of course, uh, he mentioned uh, Leo and Jim, and I looked, and it was very clear that this was an excellent place to proceed with that work. Unfortunately for Cindy, uh, she also got an excellent job offer, and so here we stay for the better part of 30-some years to, to, uh, to do our work, and it's, uh, it's been quite a joy. Uh, I will finish with George a George story at the end for Leo's benefit. And I did thank him for the, he asked how he got me here, and I said I thanked him for the generous honorary. <laughs> you guys didn't know about that? <laughs> so, so today, what I wanted to do, we're going to talk about fibrosis, uh, and we'll talk about work that really has evolved over three decades. <coughs> the last, at least the last two of which, <coughs> represent a very tight collaborative enterprise with the, uh, the Hankey Laboratory. And so we almost present these things interchangeably. Some of, these, some of this work was led by Craig, and some of this work is led in our lab, uh, and we pretty much share space and people and grad students and postdocs. Uh, and so that's kind of the core team. And as you'll see at the end, there's, of course, a number of other individuals uh, the point of this is to think about fibrosis in a somewhat different way than a person who was trained in the world of innate and adaptive immunity. Uh, so we'll work through that. So we're going to think about uh, fibrosis in a somewhat a more expansive way than is traditionally thought. Uh, this isn't to say the traditional thinking is not correct. It is, and it's well worked out. But there is an additional uh, direction. It's a little bit of feedback, yeah? You okay? okay. And so I, I started with this idea that the, that idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is a progressive fibrosis, emanates from a fibrogenic niche, meaning both the matrix and the cell populations have a, a self-sustaining aspect to them that was uh, not really well appreciated, but makes sense given everything we know about fibrosis. So here's the conceptual framework that I now will begin with when I teach our fellows and give lectures around the country. And this is now only about two years old in terms of the, the way I think about it. Every pathologist knows this already. Buster, you need to go into the Buster box. Thank you. <laughs> into the Buster box, right? Was that, was that on cue, Peter? <laughs> it is indeed. 
Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> yes. Are you serious? I know. You know the rules, brother. So there is um, self-limited fibrosis. Have I got your attention again? <laughs> you don't mind. You don't mind? Good. Okay. So there's self-limited fibrosis after a discrete injury. And the best example that I use in, in the lung is acute lung injury, but this is true for any wound. The wounds are self-limited. And then there's the durable fibrosis that follows a myocardial infarction, which is also something reversible in lung injury, self-limited with a discrete scar. And these are all driven by a discrete injury that's defined and known. It has a beginning and an end. Then there's this progressive fibrosis. And we see this in a number of different settings in all organs of the body where there isn't clearly an exogenous driver in the progressive phase. When the disease begins, there is often an injury that's defined then, or is more or less elucidated. In IPF, it's not so clear. But, for example, in cirrhosis or in kidney fibrosis, you can control the hypertension that leads to, leads to kidney fibrosis. You can abstain from alcohol, and the fibrosis can continue. And it's not entirely clear how that happens. And idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, similarly. There is epithelial attrition, for whatever reason. There are a number of epithelial stresses that have been identified. But the fibrosis continues in the absence of clear exogenous drivers. There's an intrinsic cell autonomous, matrix autonomous pattern to it that we don't really understand. <coughs> so three kinds of fibrosis, reversible, durable, and progressive. So I'll begin with a case. I put the year, because as everyone who studies this disease knows well, the diagnosis of the diagnosis of, uh, of IPF is now made without a lung biopsy in many, many cases because of the characteristic anatomy of the CT scan of the chest. So this story would probably have maybe been a little different uh, later on, but the disease is, is characteristic, and here's the pattern. Patient presents in around 1992, 50 years old. He had two brothers with IPF. And he was concerned about his health and the health of his children because he learned that this indeed was an autosomal dominant disease with, a, with a incomplete penetrance, but in some families really almost classic Mendelian one-to-one. -one. I saw him in clinic and he had a completely normal exercise tolerance. He was a, a fit 50-year-old. Uh, he used to run probably, you know, maybe three to five K about four times a week. So not, a, not an extreme exerciser, but more than enough to know if he had any issues and reasonably fit. No occupational exposures. He was a lifelong non-smoker. On physical exam, it was completely normal. He was a healthy 50-year-old. Normal chest x-ray, normal pulmonary function testing. Now this is the material he brought with him. He had a very uh, nice folder with everything in it when he came. Thanks to our nurse coordinators who are expert in this. To, per, this person had to drive five hours to come, so we try to organize things even before we had electronic medical records so that people didn't have to make unnecessary trips. Brothers, both of them had a classic history. They both began with exertional breathlessness. They both had a dry cough. They both, when you listen to their chest, had end inspiratory crackles that are very characteristic of pulmonary fibrosis. Their fingers were clubbed, toes were not, 
and they had cyanosis when they exercised, they actually turned blue. They were also exercisers, and so they were tolerant. You don't see that in people who are sedentary. But people who exercise will actually exercise to hypoxemia that's visible. They had a decrease in both their vital capacity and total lung capacity, uh, an increase in their FEV1, that's the amount of air they blow out in one second, divided by their vital capacity, which is the total amount of air they breathe out. Their diffusing capacity was decreased. Their blood gases showed an increase in the AA gradient with respiratory alkalosis. That's mild. This is all classic uh, clinical presentation. And they did indeed desaturate with exercise when they were tested. This is the lung biopsy, the oldest brother. Of course, the second brother didn't need a lung biopsy. Uh, this brother probably would not have either. Looking at the biopsy, it was read as classic, usual interstitial pneumonia uh, with all of the typical features. And I'll draw your attention to the hallmark lesion for the benefit of the trainees. Uh, this lesion here is a fibroblastic focus. We'll look at it in a little more detail. A couple things to point out about the IPF lung that is striking. Similar to cancer, the disease process often embeds itself in the midst of what most pathologists, and you'll forgive me because there are morphologists in the room, would say are absolutely normal alveolar walls. So there's a fibrotic lesion there are, there's some mature fibrosis, and there's this absolutely normal-looking lung. Probably isn't, but to, to the eye, it's normal. Well, not such good luck. Our patient developed IPF. Good luck in the sense that he lived in Minnesota, and it's still at that time there were only three centers that were really regularly doing lung transplants, St. Louis, Toronto, and Minnesota, and he got one. And this is scary because he knew what was coming. And his brothers weren't so lucky in terms of when they got it. He was the youngest. This is the transplant specimen. Now, of course, we didn't get the whole lung. There might have been a little bit of lung that was breathing. It had to be, right? He was alive. But almost all of the lung looked like this, with completely remodeled lung metaplastic, hyperplastic, I guess hyperplastic is more accurate, epithelium and these honeycomb cysts that are there. Yeah, this is kind of a problem disease, which eventually got, has gotten the attention of big pharma. It took a while. Part of it, I think, that part of the attention comes because fibrosis was really treated, again, much like cancer. You have thyroid cancer, you have ovarian cancer, you have breast cancer, you have, and, the, and everybody knew that there were common themes, everybody knew there were oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, but in terms of the way people studied and thought about cancer, it was organ specific, and it was owned by the people who own the organ. Okay, I mean, the, fibrosis is the same way. We even give it different names, we don't even call it fibrosis. We have cirrhosis and nephrosclerosis, and we have all these names which I should blame the pathologist for. <laughs> but it's fibrosis. And again, fibrosis, thinking about it as, is it reversible? Is it durable? Or is it progressive? And if it's progressive, is it progressive in the context of exogenous drivers that you can identify, as would be the case in autoimmune diathesis? Or is it progressive in the absence of obvious exogenous drivers, as in IPF, or in an alcoholic who's abstaining or in someone whose blood pressure has been well controlled. So this kills 40,000 Americans and 1 million persons worldwide. So it's still an orphan disease in that sense. So 40,000 doesn't get you... And part of the reason it's an orphan disease is because it's 100% lethal. If it had the same kill rate as most diseases, it would be an enormously common disease which is interesting. Um, there is this relentless expansion and alteration of the alveolar mesenchymal cell population that deposits collagen, contracts, and you die by suffocating unless you get a heart attack first. There are two new FDA-approved therapies, perfenidone, 
which was had been studied for many, many years, as, as Jim knows. It was something that was studied in liver cirrhosis back in the 80s. It finally made its way into the formulary. And then tetanab, which, was, uh, which is a multifunctional kinase inhibitor, which was developed for malignancies, didn't work too well in cancer. Well, it worked fine at the, hit the target, but didn't do much to stop cancer, but it did give a signal in, in pulmonary fibrosis. So we now have a signal, so we have proof of concept that IPF can be slowed. It's a trajectory slower. It looks very much like the earliest days of chemotherapy. There is a clear signal, but everyone still pretty much dies. It's just that we have a little more time. And maybe in some patients, better than that. So there will be the, in, the infrequent patient who looks like they almost have a remission of the disease. There is genetic risk. The most frequent polymorphism occurs in the MUC5B gene. Surfactant genes are seen in about 15 to 20, and telomerase genes are seen in about 10% of the population. Uh, similar profile in familial pulmonary fibrosis, which is about 1 in 20 of the cases are genetic, and the other ones are sporadic. But maybe it is a little like cancer in that it's a genetic disease. Some people harbor loss of function mutations in one of their tumor suppressors. It's a very rare patients who have gain of function in, in oncogenes at germline. Uh, but there's this association, and it's strong. And by the way, it's not actually considered as people are enrolled into trials now. So we have no idea whether or not some of these polymorphisms, whether they're causative or association, would mark individuals for better response or no response to therapy. So this is the IPF lung in, in zoom out power, really to make that point about the, what's called the spatial and temporal heterogeneity of the disease. But in, what it really shows is just how normal some of those airways look compared to just how fibrotic other places look. Uh, and there is a pattern to this, as every pathologist who studies the lung, and most even who don't, know very well. And there is a, a couple of places, if you zoom out, like right here, where you have a fibroblastic focus you can really not even appreciate, but we will get closer. Uh, this is the appearance of a fibroblastic fo focus. It, it has some very interesting characteristics. Depending on how you slice, cut, and view, you will see a number of views that look like this, where the focus is adjacent to an absolutely normal appearing or just beginning to thicken wall. That's a clue. And it's filled with mesenchymal cells, mostly myofibroblasts. They're alpha muscle actin positive, well-organized alpha SMA. If you do IF, you can see the nice, if you do phylloidin, you'll see it. Um, and then there's this other area that we pretty much don't pay much attention to because it kind of is on the thick side of the mess. And here again, you can see these have that, what, what many pathologists, when they read it out, call young-looking uh, fibroblasts and loose connective tissue. But interestingly enough, we don't actually know what's in there in terms of the whole contents. We certainly know what's in there. It's collagen, ivernectin, tenacin. But we can go on. I mean, you know the connective tissue components better than I. But the point is that there's never been a clear anatomic registration of the full context hyaluronan, abundant in this area. So this has been 3D mapped and published recently in JCI Insight. And so these fibroblastic foci form a multifocal serpiginous network that sometimes connect and sometimes don't. There are about 175 microns in length on average. Some are three or 400, some are as small as 50 to 75. Putting a fair amount of emphasis on the anatomy here because it turns out that that's what drives the hypothesis. There's very, very specific topographic clues that lead to the molecular 
inter, you know, uh, in, in investigations that we pursued. So here are the signature properties of IPF. There is a peripheral basal genesis. It always, always, always starts at the very bottom of the lung and the perimeter of the lung, with very few exceptions. So when I say always, you could say this, and only about three to five percent of the cases will be exceptions. So it's a very strong role. It spreads centripetally. You rarely see a, a disease further in without seeing it out. And these, okay, so this is very non-random. This is as non-random as, as stochasticity gets, which again is a clue to it being a little more of a deterministic process than what you see, say, in ARDS, acute lung injury, DAD, where you, know, you get all this damage. It is quite chaotic. Now, the repair process is very orderly, but the, the damage is chaotic. This is not chaotic. So calling it injury is a bit of a misnomer because I think it gives the impression that the initial events are somewhat stochastic. They, they can't be. They're very determined. And then, of course, the fibroblastic focus is the hallmark lesion, and I will show you information to demonstrate that the matrix itself is fibrogenic. That is, it can corrupt an otherwise normal mesenchymal cell fibroblast to become like an IPF fibroblast. There are indeed fibrogenic progenitors. That means I will take the progenitor out of an IPF lung, put it into a bland environment, and it will create fibrosis. And there are fibrogenic myofibroblasts. These myofibroblasts are activated myofibroblasts. Everybody knows that and they're very familiar with them. Pathologists see them all the time in every fibrotic lesion, wounds, any tissue that's injured, doesn't matter. But these are fibrogenic, meaning take them out of the body, put them into an environment, and they will form fibrotic lesions. So it's much more like malignancy. There's a durable change in the cells, and if that weren't enough, there is a cancer stroma. So even if you are a otherwise uncorrupted fibroblast, and if you see this matrix produced by these cells, you're going to become a fibrotic fibroblast. And what that means is that when you take these cells out of the, out of the IPF lung and you look at their signaling circuitry, their cancer phenocopies, P10, the classic tumor suppressor, is low. The AKT pathway is on. Calveolin 1 is low. They act as if they have oncogenes activated, but they're not caused by germline or somatic mutations, so far as we know. This occurs through other means that are not yet elucidated. Fibrogenic matrix, fibrogenic progenitors, fibrogenic myofibroblasts. So there is a extrinsic component and a cell intrinsic or autonomous component to IPF. That's why it's been so tough. And this may be what happens in other diseases with very discrete causes, even when the driver seems to be gone. First, the evidence that the IPF matrix is fibrogenic. A very simple experiment. And of course, um, a big thank you to what is now Bionet, um, what was tissue procurement. We do all of this work in human specimens from patients who insist that their cells be used for research. They come to our clinic and it's the first thing they tell us, which is kind of interesting. You have to almost tell them to calm down um, because they, you know, when you have something like this, and of course until the last three years there was no treatment except transplant, patients are all in on the clinical research, as we call it, which is essentially fundamental studies, looking under the hood, as I call it, for the patients to try to understand how the circuitry is deranged. So simple experiment. IPF fibroblasts, explant. We do explant cultures because they're quick. And, you, and we get a lot of our transplant specimens in the middle of the night, so it's nice to have a 15-minute protocol. Just cut them up, throw them in a dish, and they will, the, the, the mesenchymal cells will grow out. They have all the fibroblast markers. That's the, the cells we use from controls, which are mostly going to be lung cancer with a distant sample. 
So these are not normal fibroblasts, not even close, but they're kind of age matched because these patients are all in the, their 50s and 60s and, and a few in their 70s. Uh, and they're also coming from a non-normal general environment. COPD is a common background. So those are the controls. Some of our controls are indeed more normal. We have a couple specimens that are in the sample that were from young people who had blebectomies because they had apical blebs and got pneumothoraces and needed to have surgical correction because of multiple pneumothoraces. So the control population is mostly age-matched, mostly COPD, mostly lung cancer with a sample that's morphologically not involved, and some others. So it's a mixed population. The IPF population is clean. 100% classical, usual interstitial pneumonitis with a typical clinical presentation. Fibroblasts control IPF, decellularized extracellular matrix slices, basically a deli slicer, and then digest away the cells with detergents and enzymes. So it's not, whatever matrix is soluble is gone, but the durable matrix is present. So that's what's there. We do genome-wide transcriptional and translational profiling. So we look at the entire transcriptome, and then we look at all of the messages that are bound to ribosomes. We call that the translatome. And we're looking for non-randomness. Simple as that. There was no, no, um, no hypothesis. This is pure fishing, which in Minnesota goes well because it's a major industry, but in, at the, it turns out that as you enter the, the sphere of the zip codes inside the beltway, it goes poorly. <laughs> Who knew? Nonetheless, they did support this without being aware of it. And we did go fishing. And it turns out that the matrix increased ribosome recruitment to more than 300 genes that'll be connected to a, that'll be part of a connective tissue ontology. MMPs, all the collagens, fibronectin, um, every gene, that, every family that you can imagine that is in the matrix family <laughs> was part of this group that was translationally activated. Transcriptional differences were relatively modest. Almost 80% of the variants that distinguish control from experimental, from IPF from control, was at the level of translation, and almost all of it was driven by the matrix. So about 15% of the variants was cell intrinsic, and 85% was matrix driven. So that's useful information. Now we're not fishing anymore. And that went much better. At the <clears throat> so what are these transcripts that are translationally activ activated share in common? Number one on the list, thankfully, because this allowed us to get the paper published much more quickly, was microRNA-29. Well, why is that? For those who are not microRNA aficionados, MIR-29 is the one that has been, that there's a lot of prior knowledge is a very strong negative regulator of almost all connective tissue genes. In this group, I think about 50 of the genes had MIR-29 targets. There were six other microRNAs on the list. We didn't touch those because we wanted proof of concept for microRNA-29. Is it truly functionally broken? So the prediction, of course, is that because microRNA-29 is a negative regulator, a tumor suppressor, if you will, is a negative regulator, it's a break on connective tissue production, translation mainly. Um, we took a look at the direct evidence. And so you put the fibroblasts on the matrix, control and IPF, and you look at the three species of microRNA-29, a and B are encoded by one gene, B and C by another. There are two genes. Annoying, I know. Uh, so we'll, we'll focus on A and C because they are discrete gene products. Uh, B is embedded in both of the transcripts that get processed. And what you can see, and this is about the most robust thing we've ever seen. Every single matrix prep, every single cell, this happens every single time. Nothing works every single time. <laughs> no, I mean, it's really... Uh, it was. Because yeah, we, of course, we, uh, and what you can see is that 
there is a concomitant increase in secretion into the media of type 1 collagen when you do this. And then we put MIR-29 back into the cells sitting on the IPF matrix. And what we see is that in each of the four examples, you compare control and IPF of genes that were MIR-29 responsive in the system. It restores each of them back to baseline, except for this one, which is about attenuated by about 70%. And then for the control, we take the ones that have, don't have MIR-29 targets, don't respond in the system, and they just wandered around. So indeed, reconstitution of microRNA 29 makes these cells look okay again, and the collagen goes down, as well as a number of the other things that we've got there. So this is now an established fact that when you put an otherwise control, if you will, cell on an IPF matrix, microRNA 29 goes down, the connective tissue genes are translationally activated and you're going to get synthesis and it is a feedback loop that will be self-sustaining. This happens indefinitely. So what are the critical matrix properties and can they be parsed? And this gets to what I was talking a while about, about how do you model these things. So there are literally dozens of matrix macromolecules and then there are all these properties we have to consider. They're either linked or orthogonal. We don't know in each case, and so you have to be able to put together a model. Now, if you're lucky, you can parse it. The prevailing hypothesis is it's mechanics, because we know how mechanosensitive fibroblasts are, and we know a lot about the circuitry of mechanosensitivity. And the prevailing hypothesis is that when the matrix gets stiffer, there'll be more and more connected tissue made. And so we assume microRNA 29, when you put it on a stiff matrix, will go down. Composition, I told you that we know the major constituents, but we don't know all of them. And then there's organization, that sort of annoying property, which is part of the recognition phenotype for the pathologist reading the slide. There, there's something about the way the collagen bundles are organized in IPF that's very distinctive and I remember getting those lessons, and so this has been known since Liebau published his paper on usual interstitial pneumonia. So maybe they're parsable, maybe they're not. The easiest thing to model is stiffness. Everybody thinks it's stiffness, so we'll test stiffness. Just as a review, the IPF lung is stiff, very, very stiff. This is uh, the, the doctor slide, okay? For most people in this room, the slightest bit of effort transpulmonary pressure will completely inflate the lung. And you get almost full inflation with almost no effort. If you have pulmonary fibrosis, and this is the typical, this is one patient, so here it is, um, but very typical. You start out with an inflection that's not too bad, and then bang, you hit the tensile limit of collagen. And it's just like pulling on a rope. And they just can't get air in their lungs. And so they sit there breathing at 40 or 50 times a minute instead of at 10 to move their, the amount of air they need to survive. Okay, organ scale, stiff. We did some uniaxial stretch with uh, Victor Barocas and his grad student, and indeed, at the millimeter scale, these are millimeter strips, they're stiff. And Eric White's group and Dan Schumperlin's group, White at Michigan and Schumperlin at, at uh, Mayo, did some poking at the microscopic level with atomic force microscopy, and indeed found more than half of the readings were well above. And so you're looking at about an order of magnitude stiffer, about tenfold, on average, on average. But I am sure that if you poke here versus there versus there, it's going to be different. This was not anatomically registered, but this is the average. All right, this is what happens when you create a stiff matrix for otherwise normal fibroblasts. You use a polyacrylamide gel. This is typical. All the tissue engineers do this. They functionalize these gels with collagen. We used collagen 1, 3, and fibronectin, which are indeed the three most abundant components. We did not include HA in this. 
might have been interesting. We've done it later, it doesn't matter. Uh, and what you see is the exact opposite. Stiffness activates microRNA 29. And it does, through, does so through MRTF and YAP, some canonical transcription factors. This is the off signal for physiological healing. When a wound or a visceral uh, injury heals up and, and there is enough collagen, the cell senses it. And the mechanosensor turns on MIR-29 and shuts down collagen synthesis. It's a beautiful feedback system. It's broken in IPF and stiffness is not the answer. What is the answer is that there appears to be a metabolic block. It's a classic metabolic block. When you look at the RNA biogenesis pathway, transcription, processing, and eventually binding to the, uh, the uh, drosia agile complex, what you see is there is an accumulation of transcript <coughs> and too little mature product. So it's a processing problem. And this is heavy lifting by Jeremy Herrera, who really has become an expert morphologist by learning at the elbow of Colleen Forster, who is an author on the paper that, that describes this work. And so we looked at all of the different processing components. This is one image from, uh, we identify foci that are, that are active and fresh because they're pro-collagen positive. This goes back to the uh, mcdonald kuhn paper where they developed the very first reagents to be able to, turn to, to um, image pro-collagen, which is, of course, an intracellular product and is only seen in cells that are actively synthesizing collagen. Because there's so much collagen around, if you stand for collagen, guess what? Yeah. It looks like the, the rainstorm we had uh, Saturday night at the Gopher Game. Uh, and so we looked at all of these, and the one most interesting thing, and again, anatomic registration is the, is, the, is the answer, is that you see that in the control, you have a dicer in other regions of the lung. If you look in the fibroblastic focus, there's nothing. And the other signals are present. And I'll give you a better look here. Uh, with a little bit better contrast. So here's a, a typical focus. And this is the pro-collagen stain. This is the core of the focus. We took this very heavily stained area. And we also, so we look at the core area and the perimeter of the focus. And look at that sharp demarcation. So that's where the focus ends, that's here. All right. And if you look at Dicer, which is a critical component in the processing step. Uh, what you see is that in the myofibroblast core, and only in the core, there is nothing. There's nothing, no protein, and if you look at RNA using RNA scope, you will see one or two dots. And if you compare that to the core area, so the perimeter is here, Probably the cores here and the perimeters here. So you compare that to the perimeter, you get a lot of signal and it's demarcated. And there's RNA. So you have RNA scope positive, protein positive at the perimeter and the whole rest of the lung, by the way. And only in the myofibroblastic core do you see this. So if you don't register anatomically, you're screwed. You don't see this. So that's the critical is to blend the molecular and cellular with the morphology. Okay, now the proof of concept studies. So you take the primary fibroblast, you knock down Dicer with, with uh, a short hairpin RNA, you get a nice knockdown. If you knock it out, this is bad. Don't knock it out. This is true in cancer as well. In cancer, Dicer is decreased. If you lose heterozygosity, the tumors fail. You need half. It's interesting. Same thing here. If you knock it down completely, get rid of it, you don't, you don't get the phenotype. So if you knock it down about 50 to 75%, mere 29A goes down so that we knock down Dicer and we can phenocopy what we saw. And you get activation of connective tissue gene uh, translation and pr production. So it decreases microRNA 29 not surprisingly, decreases processing of all canonically processed mirrors, but mirror 29 is particularly sensitive, they're not all equal. 
And here we see collagen 1 and MMP2, just as readouts. Cell autonomous test. What you're looking at here is Dicer 1 knockdown fibroblasts put into a zebrafish embryo that is fertilized, and we let it go for two days. And we say, okay, fibroblasts, do what you do. So these are Dicer 1 knockdowns and scrambled. And we're staining for procollagen, which is red. And you can see the results. And when you quantify, you can see that what happens in Dicer knockdown, you get a cell autonomous collagen activated phenotype in a zebrafish in vivo assay. And if you put these into the tail vein of mice, you will see this is trichrome, and this is, of course, uh, the immunochemistry. You will begin to see fibrotic lesions. There are a couple of areas, we looked through the whole lung, there are a couple of brown spots in the control, in the scramble, but these were very abundant. And the trichrome also shows increased collagen. So cell autonomous in Dicer knockdown. So I've hopefully convinced you that there is a fibrogenic matrix here that creates a Dicer 1 knockdown that leads to mere 29 processing failure and, re and relieve, basically relieves the translational repression of all the connected tissue genes. So there's a self-sustaining fibrotic loop. And I'll finish the talk with the evidence for progenitor cells that are fibrogenic. First, no surprise, it hadn't been done, but there's no surprise that, and I call these MPCs, if you call them MSCs, which is of course what they are if you use the language, then you have to fight with reviewers who say these are not stem cells, which of course they are not, they are progenitors. So we correctly call them mesenchymal progenitor cells. That was one of the things that we had to do, and we didn't want to confuse people, but that's what they are, they are indeed, and so are the other ones that everybody calls MSCs, by the way. They're hardly stem cells. Um, but we, we sorted them with a canonical um, sort, C4, SSEA4, which is, you know, stage-specific embryonic antigen 4, which all mesenchymal progenitors have. And we can get these cells out. Yes, they're progenitor cells. They have all the classical canonical progenitor transcription factors, uh, 4, nanox, SOX2. So they're progenitors. But when you transcriptionally profile them, Remember, I told you it's about 15% of the, the differences were at the level of transcription, about 85% translation when we looked at the cell autonomous component as well. So this is a transcriptional component that you can detect because you don't get enough cells to translation and profile these cells. But you get a nice top 50 heat map. So that's what, this is just a top 50 heat map, uh, which shows that indeed they are transcriptionally distinct. So we take control, IPF, send them, this is bulk, not single cell, bulk, transcriptomics, and you get a nice difference. If you take their progeny and put them into a zebrafish, and their progeny are the cells that are sitting in a tissue culture dish for 21 days exactly, in standard growth medium that everybody uses, Dobeco's medium. This is what the cells do. The IPF cells look like that, and the control cells look like that. So there's a cell autonomous phenotype here. Well, what it means, I don't know, but there's no question. And you know which of those fibroblasts you'd rather have in your lung. <laughs> and if you do this, and this is an assay developed by Corey Hogebaum when he was still at, at uh, Michigan before he moved to Cedar sinai got recruited by Paul Noble to continue his work. This is a mouse tail vein assay. Not too different from what I showed you before. In, in this particular assay, you get these very large perivascular fibrotic lesions. You cannot find the cells. We had 12 mice. We couldn't find any cells. I'm sure if we fluorescently labeled them, we would have found some uh, in controls. But controls just don't do anything. And the IPF cells form exuberant fibrotic lesions in all the mice. So it's a xenograft acid. So luckily I was doing all this cancer biology, so I import, you, can, you know, Kaylee can see I've imported all this stuff that I learned doing cancer biology, which was very helpful. Now this is the, this was, I call the money shot. This one, Nobody doubts it after this. One cell from two different IPF patients, one cell, one of these MPCs, put into methyl cellulose. Of course, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's self renews It makes a nice colony. It's a pretty good-sized colony. Drop it on a dish for 21 days, put it into a zebrafish, and this is what you get. If you do the same with a control, 
you get what I showed you before. Not only that, if you look at the cells, they have the classic IPF signature. Right. So they're, they, are, they have the activated, of course they're activated with alpha smog, but that's not the most important. <coughs> Phospho AKT is activated in the colony derived cells, just like in the IPF cells. P10 is low, CAV1 is low, and there's the gap DH control. And of course, shortly after we published this work, this paper came out in science, which really helped us tremendously. Because of course you can't lineage trace humans. They did a beautiful lineage trace study. And what they showed was that there are dermal lineage cells that you can identify very, very early in development that are intrinsically phycogenic. So it's true. These cells exist in nature. This was, of course, a mouse lineage trace study. What makes them phybogenic? So I'll finish with this sequence. So, for, of course, when you want to go back and, and do a study with a little bit more of a hypothesis than, oh, yeah, we went fishing, look what we found, voila, okay. But, so we then looked at the list, and we absolutely, positively cherry-picked one of the translationally activated genes that everyone who studies proliferative diseases, malignant or non-malignant, likes, which is S100A4, also known as metastatin. In cancer, it mediates proliferation, migration, and invasion, and the levels are high in cancer cells that are invasive, and they are high in the IPF MPCs <coughs> as well, based on our transcriptomics. And indeed, it turns out that S100A4, and this is no surprise because it's true in cancer stem cells as well, that it is necessary for IPF MPC self renewal. Here, S100A4 was at least knocked down to a very low level. If you leave the exposure longer, you'll get, of course, something, but it was knocked down quite a bit. Um, and what you see is colony number and colony size are both dramatically reduced. So this is necessary for that. But how about in vivo? So this is, of course, annoying because the reviewers love transgenic knock-in, knock-out mice. They hate stuff like this. So why don't you just make a mouse? And of course, this is, a, as I told you, with Dicer, it's been done. And if you knock out Dicer, you don't get cancer. And in Dicer replete animals, you don't get cancer. In Dicer heterozygotes, you get lot. They get huge tumors. And so here we said, okay, well, just, we're going to just do this with those same fibroblasts that we knocked down S100A4 in. We'll go back and see what happens. To do this, uh, Craig Hankey's lab developed a really nice twist on the classic bleomycin fibrosis model. So what he did was he dropped the dose to about one-third of the usual. You get, still get some injury and you get some room, if you will. Now we sort of borrow the language of our immunology colleagues where you have to make a room if you're going to do it, put in exogenous uh, lymphocytes into a system or exogenous macrophages into a system. Uh, and then you introduce your progenitor cells, and these are progenitor cells. These are not the derivatives. These are the actual progenitors from a fresh sort. They're basically in culture for about six days to allow the knockdown to take hold. They're still all C4 positive. They still form colonies. So you get bleo, you add the progenitors, and then you harvest so that's zero weeks, two weeks, and six weeks. Now, in the classic bleomycin model, if you get full-dose bleomycin, you get lots of inflammation and injury, uh, which will peak about here. You get lots of fibrosis, which peaks about there, and then it comes right down, and by six weeks, they're just barely above control. So you're going to see something with this model that's not all that different, a little bit less impressive. So let's look at the bleomycin only first, uh, which are here, which actually superimpose with the no bleomycin saline control. You definitely get a little bit of increased collagen, and it immediately re reverts to normal. But it's not really much more than you get um, with uh, control M. So control MPCs are here. I should say the saline control is flat, I'm sorry. The, this is what you get with that bleomycin, whether you put in control MPCs, which if they were really MSCs, 
you might think might attenuate things a bit, but you don't see much change. But what happens when you put in those fibrogenic mesenchymal progenitors from IPF? You get persistent. And if you let it go longer, you actually get progressive fibrosis. It doesn't go away. These cells drive fibrosis. And if you knock down S100A4, you attenuate a good bit of this. And of course, that's just one, concent you know, one concentration, if you will. This was repeated in a, sec in a second cell line with another cohort of mice with roughly the same results. So we didn't, it didn't go all the way down. Uh, I think if we did it enough times, we would show a small, significant difference <coughs> from glio only. But here, of course, it's non-significant. Where are these cells? <coughs> I told you that the, the focus is polarized with sharp demarcation, pro-collagen, no dicer, no mere 29. Lots of dicer, lots of pro-collagen, you know. So it's kind of the way it's set up. And what you see with S100A4, it's right at that perimeter. There's almost no staining in the core. Here's the alpha small, and you can see where the alpha small cells are. Then you also can see them kind of sneaking in to those otherwise normal looking. So these lesions have to be chosen carefully. You know, if you look at 100 fibroblastic foci, only 10 of them will be cut just perfectly. So you can see this perimeter region adjacent to normal looking walls. So we did a series of stains on the perimeter and the core. So the cells expressing S100A4, C4, and CHI-67 co-localized. So these are not, these are serial sections. These are not um, multiple stains. So just serial sections done. And what you see is that that perimeter region is S100A4 positive, okay, um, C4 positive, and CHI-67 positive on serial sections, and none of that is seen in the myofibroblastic core. It's all at the perimeter of the, of the lesion. So this is our working model based on that. <coughs> Again, borrowing a little bit from cancer, we call it the active fibrotic front, where the progenitors are, their transit amplifying progeny are, CHI-67 positive, uh, and where the S100A4 positive cells are, some of the progenitors undoubtedly and their transit amplifying progeny also. It's a proliferating region. It's the region where cells are beginning to invade, where the alveolar walls are beginning to expand in that perfectly captured focus. And, if you ever, and it's true in every one of these that you capture perfectly. Again, it's not a model. You get what you get when you do human sampling. And then there's the core, which is where all the collagen's being made, dicer deficient, MIR-29 deficient. So this is a disease with intrinsically fibrogenic cells that are sitting up here and good old activated myofibroblasts sitting down there. Now, which of these matrices causes this corruption of normal cells? We don't know that. We haven't registered that. So we know where the proliferating cells are and the invading cells are. We don't know which matrix is which. Our decellularized matrix studies are done almost as a grind and find experiment. So we've got work to do in terms of registration. And uh, I just showed this as a, this image will appear in a review article that will be published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation, I think, the end of this year. There will be a whole issue on fibrosis which was really a pleasure because hanging out with a bunch of fibrologists, what could be more fun? Um, so I argue the next step is really doing this systematically and developing a in silico model of what's going on with a complete registration. I asked Leo about that fancy machine mass spec, which is going to be essential to be able to register pixel by pixel. So here's what we're arguing, that if we're really going to get this, we probably have some interdependence of the different dimensions that we're looking at and some orthogonality, and we're not going to know that unless we have all the data. Because if you make inferences about whether something is related to something, 
without sufficient amounts of data, you're always going to bias your experiments. So we're going to try to create an unbiased in silico model of what's going on in this lung that includes ECM components and critically important are gags, big surprise, um, because they mess with these cells tremendously and they all bear CD44 and a handful bear RAM. Not all, most of them don't. Most of them are RAM negative, but it's there. Maybe that subpopulation is very interesting, who knows? We haven't been able to, we haven't pulled those out yet. So we have cell identity. What kind of cells are we looking at? Epithelial, endothelial, what is their differentiated state? What is their biology? Looking at microRNA expression or surrogates. Looking at canonical transcription factors involved in mechanosensing. Looking at signaling molecules that are critical for cell function that we already know are aberrant. And most importantly, with our tissue engineering colleagues, do mechanical measurements that are not just static, not just Young's modules, not just the tension, but also looking at dynamic viscoelasticity and other stress relaxation characteristics, that all of which are very important. We know that from the black box experiments that our tissue engineer colleagues do. They do incredibly sophisticated development of materials, and they can show that they can make cells do all these different things by varying each of these parameters. And most of the cells they study are either mesenchymal progenitors or fibroblasts. But the cell's a black box. And we do just the opposite. We like pour a polycolloid gel, throw some collagen on it, and say, oh, good, here's that stiff gel. And they look, really? <laughs> so we can fix that. And so we, this, the proposal we just sent in includes the tissue engineers and us to see if we can get at this. And hopefully we will identify a pathologist who needs a research project, which is part of the pitch here. Because this is not for amateurs. My postdoc, former grad student Jeremy Herrera, is going off to an advanced uh, postdoc in a great position at the Wellcome Trust in Manchester. And he did very heavy lifting here. He, like he said, he spent probably three full years at Colleen's Elbow, and he's become a very good morphologist. And he worked with Emil, and he worked with a number of other very good pathologists. So I think he's, and he, had, he has the skill. And of course, this is something that you, you know when you, if you're a radiologist, you know who the radiologist radiologists are. And if you're a pathologist, you know who the pathologist pathologists are. He sees patterns that I can't see, even after he shows them to me. And eventually he puts the dotted line around and the, geez, you're right. He has that kind of eye. Well, he's leaving. So we're going to be making that pitch. And of course, here are the people uh, who have helped tremendously in an absolute direct Shout out once again to Colleen. This doesn't happen. This doesn't happen without her being willing to, to train Jeremy and teach him essentially all the tricks of the trade. And bless him because he is a good listener. He's, he's one of those people who shows up, shuts up, and listens. And when it's all done, he like, oh my God, you knew all that? Uh, so he doesn't blab, but he is. This, this, the still waters run very deep, and they are lucky to get him in Manchester, England. Thank you for your attention. So, yeah, go ahead. Well, I'll start. As an old pathologist, I was taught that fibrosis is irreversible. But you talked about some drugs now that can slow fibrosis. Is there any effort now to develop drugs can, that can actually reverse existing fibrosis? Yeah, well, there's, we know that proof of concept exists from the hepatitis C virus studies. Yeah. Very advanced cirrhosis gets better if you kill the virus. Now, of course, that's in one of those exogenously driven ones. Right. So you get rid of the driver, right. the fibrosis can go away. Uh, and the, the question is whether the, what we're calling the sort of durable fibrosis can be reversed. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We'll see. But I think the goal here is to go after the areas that are, would, would be more amenable to what we think of classically as a proliferating, invading, self-renewing population. Uh, but no, I think that, that all of the rules of thumb are, are kind of going to be called into question. What's not is the anatomy. It's correct. Just believe what you see. And that's all we did. I mean, this has been sitting there since April Lebow described usual interstitial pneumonia. But we finally believed what we saw. And we had some tools to be able to pursue it. Yeah. I'm sorry if I missed it, but um, do these uh, IPS cells express fat? Fibroblast activation protein 
Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty sure they do, but I, I don't remember. I'm sure it's been looked at by others. I seem to recall, but I just can't, I can't cite the paper for you. I'm pretty sure they do, yeah. And a differential expression then between those cells and... Control? Uh, in the front. No, we didn't look at that. Okay. That we didn't look at. But I'll bet you it's, it's, it will be different because I think it's probably in the more mature cells, but I don't know that for a fact. Yeah. So if I was trying to put together some of your morphology with the dicer, I mean, it the chemistry and with the S100A4, where does that come together? Because it seems to me like the S100A4 at that front is about where you also see that demarcation of dicer. Correct. And so are the S100A4 cells that are positive, are they dicer positive or dicer negative? They're going to be di dicer positive. Okay. So it's that, yeah. that mechanism independent of dicer and, and microRNA. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the reason you can't really model this in a transgenic animal is because you've got to create this de demarcated zone. Yeah. You know, you've re you know it's really difficult to, uh, to think about how you would model that in a genetic manner. Uh, it could be done. I mean, you could start thinking about lock, stop locks and things like that and also delete, you know, Cree locks with um, procollagen, but you're, you really are, it's, it's not a simple genetic problem that would require a lot of breeding to, to, sh to show this in any, and you would have to do it in a mouse lung, which is not a human lung. And I think that what we, you know, we see that if you put the human cells into a mouse lung, they do this. And at that interface then, is there the potential for epigenetic modification that actually leads to that loss of dicer? We would say yes. I mean, I think as you're not seeing germline mutations and you're seeing cancer phenocopy, I think the answer is yes. We just don't know where those marks are. Yeah. But I think that's exactly right. But we're going to need that kind of precision. Yeah. You're not going to see it grinding fine. Yeah. You had one slide uh, with uh, signature, gene signature for IPF, right? And it was a couple of superfound and marked IPF. So I'm wondering, this gene, uh, as I thought of it, it's first in the pillar cells, could it be a visual injury? Yeah, well, that's, that's the, conveil the prevailing wisdom is that epithelial injury and attrition from genes that are not quite right initiate the process. The challenge is why this pattern, you know, it's, it still doesn't exactly explain. Now, it is true that the mechanical forces are very different at the, where the lung ends, at the pleural surface. So you have gravity, and you also have end inspiratory collapse or very, very small alveoli. So they go through the biggest amount of changes mechanically. So that may be why it starts here, but still the multifocality is also problematic. Because you'll get skip lesions in regions that should have been exposed to those forces. Again, that doesn't, you know, it's, it's, we're stuck. I mean, we don't really know. So this tissue atlas, if you will, this 3D reconstruction, the critical cell types we think are gonna be all of them. Epithelium. What does the epithelial look look like in those alveoli that are just getting invaded? You know, is there ER stress? You can find, I mean, if you look for ER stress, you see it all over the epithelium in IPF. All the markers of, of, the, of ER stress are present. Um, so yes, and you, you see epithelial attrition for sure. You also see very dramatic hyperplastic changes. Uh, and maybe Emil will comment on that because he's. I, I don't want to get too deep into the morphology that. That is not for amateurs. This is not for amateurs. And I, I'm still a, quite an amateur in the anatomy side. Uh, but I, I think that, that we have to look more closely at the patterning. Where is the hyperplastic epithelium compared to these other things? Where is the epithelial attrition compared to these other things? We haven't really thought much about it, but the patterns were all there. They've been described, and, and every, you know, pathologists who read the lung see this, and they know this all the time. This is all correct. Uh, it's just what is it telling us about the cell and molecular biology? Yeah? Peter, just wonderful studies. Thank you so much. It's very edifying. I, I'm, I know you've thought about potential targets for therapy, and based on these observations you've presented, where is your thinking about that or the field? I think we need to um, look, identify the fibrogenic mesenchymal progenitors. We get the target. Yes, we get them as a whole. It's the same problem as the cancer stem cell. Right. So if you look at the population as a whole, you see all the cancer phenocopy stuff. Yeah. And you see also parallel circuits, right. just like you do in cancer, which will screw you when you start using drugs that, okay, so use a triple kinase inhibitor, you get a small signal. Why is that? Because there's other circuitry in place. 
So what we're trying to do is to find the, the fibrogenic <coughs> ones, the, the, the ones that, it, and using single cell seq and mass cytometry, and eventually going back and in situ to find out where are the fibrogenic ones so that we can expand those and say, okay, now what does their circuitry look like? And then, and then go for it, because fibrosis is a tough nut, as everybody knows. I told you I'd give you a George story before I left. Six months ago, I got a call from George Martin. He, are there any activated macrophages in these lesions? And I said, of course. They're activated in twos. And they're sitting right in that perimeter region, by the way, which is not surprising. Can't smell, it's true. So George has, is now another company, Riptide. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, he's got boundless energy and, and brains. So if he's lost two or three steps, he's still at least five or six steps ahead of me for sure. So I have this, what do you guys think about a compound that'll take out 100% of activated M2 macrophages? So we're gonna put that into the model. And we actually proposed it in the grant. We have a, looks like you get a decent signal on our first pilot study. So there you go. So it pays to, uh, when, when George calls, pick up the phone. <laughs> That's the lesson. So I have, a, I have a George Martin story too, so. <laughs> I knew it would happen. That's why, uh, I, he, this, was a, this was a total tweak. My whole career as an assistant professor, I went out and visited him and became pals with all the people in his lab. And, you know, wow, published an enormous number of papers over the years. And George ran, and I ran, you run. And, we, uh, he was supposed to come out and run the Twin Cities Marathon at the time. It was called the City of Lakes. It was three laps around Piles, Calhoun, whatever it would be called, and uh, Lake Harriet. So a, a family emergency occurred. He couldn't run, but uh, I did, and I run one a month earlier. And then he said, well, why don't you come out and run the Marine Corps Marathon two weeks later in Washington? And I said, oh, I don't know. So I didn't do anything for two weeks. We go to the race. Ron Crystal, who you showed some data from, uh, was at NIH, and we were together. And we're at the starting line with thousands of people. And George has two Heinekens there. <laughs> <laughs> I go, George, what the hell is this Heinekens for? And he goes, I forgot my Gatorade. <laughs> <laughs> and this is all I had in the house. I drank two beers before the race. <laughs> That's a lesson to all of you marathon runners. Thank you very much. <laughs>